please join me in welcoming Jason Ng. Great. No, thank you so much for having me, uh, Anne, and uh, especially to Anne uh, and everybody here at Google, and also to the Google Policy team. Um, I want to also especially thank Paul Nicholas for helping arrange this talk. So. Thanks, you all, for coming out. Uh, hopefully, this will be a little lighthearted, fun uh, opportunity for you to learn a little bit about uh, some of the issues uh, that are taking place within the Chinese online sphere, and as also about how they affect our own issues here uh, in the US and abroad. So yeah, so um, a lot of people always ask me how I started with this. I was actually a book editor for a long time, so and I was an English major. And you, you, folks wonder how I got interested in uh, online issues and internet censorship. And I often point them to this one particular chart, which may look familiar to some of you folks who work on uh, Google Trends. Um, this is an image of uh, search volume activity coming out of a particular province in China <coughs> called Xinjiang in the Northwest um, from the dates ranging from 2009 to 2010. And even if you don't work on Google Trends, you might be able to tell that something odd is taking place here. Um, clearly something has dropped off and something didn't happen. And what didn't happen was there was no internet in Xinjiang for roughly 10 months in, uh, from July 2009 to May 2010. So, and if you don't trust Google's data, you could also perform the same sort of thing on Baidu Index and you'll get the same sort of thing. For 10 months, there was no internet essentially in an entire province in China. And when we're talking about provinces, we're talking about regions that are roughly the size of whole countries and other places. So it was from here that I got really interested in the ability of uh, governments and authorities to really control the online sphere, which a lot of folks thought was completely you know, uncontrollable. There's the famous quote of uh, Bill Clinton saying, you know, controlling the internet is like nailing jello to the wall. And obviously, China has done something to figure out a way to strap jello to the wall. And that way is using various forms of online censorship. However, the only thing is, you probably won't ever find China performing this sort of thing again for multiple reasons. But one, it would scare the bejesus out of economic uh, um, you know, investors and other businesses. People would flee if China ever turned off the internet in, say, Beijing, if they were faced with some sort of uh, uh, riot or some sort of uh, uh, you know, unrest. So that's one reason. But two, also because there's a whole other sorts of uh, tactics that they can use now. They're much more nuanced and sophisticated than simply just turning off the internet if there's a riot in um, a province. And some of those are obviously the f famed IP blocking and the blacklisting of sites in China, which many of you are, I'm sure, aware of. So YouTube, Facebook, Twitter are all essentially blocked from folks within mainland China. Uh, they're blocked from mainland Chinese folks from, being, from accessing them through the so-called Great Firewall. And then we have other forms of uh, blocking, like the so-called packet filtering. If you try and reach websites that have certain sense of keywords on them, you may not be able to get them. Uh, but what I'm particularly interested in are the sort of filtering and uh, disruptions that take place on the site level. Uh, these are issues that are really complicated and have to deal with a lot with self-censorship by private companies within China who have to deal with government uh, oversight and trying to figure out what do we allow and what, <clears throat> what do we not allow? <clears throat> so, um, the, and in particular, I'm focusing on search blocks, which is my area of expertise. And I look at <clears throat> search blocks on one particular social media website, Sina Weibo, and how they're implemented and what is actually blocked. So, if we move on, what, but first, what is Sina Weibo? Some of you may have heard about it um, and been uh, familiar with perhaps its reach and its power now within China. And some, of the, some folks refer to it as a sort of Twitter copycat, but it's more than just a Twitter copycat. Sure, you, can, you all have on Weibo your own 140 character uh, you know, posts that you can put up on your own page. Uh, but it also has these ability to, uh, you know, there's polls on the Sina Weibo, there's uh, threaded comments, so you can have conversations on Weibo very easily. There's ways of, you know, dating portal type uh, activity. It's more akin to Facebook than actually just a Twitter microblog site. So what sort of content do you find on Sina Weibo? 
stuff like this. Uh, people posting, you know, this sort of content that you would find in, uh, in you know, Western media, Western social media. You know, frivolous, fun pictures of uh, stuffed animals and uh, people's pets. So that's one kind of content that you find on Sina Weibo. However, you also can find stuff like this. Uh, slightly more provocative images that were circulated. This, was, this one was from uh, 2012. Uh, there was a chemical factory protest in Sichuan, and uh, there was this iconic photo that was circulated across Weibo um, of, of, a, of a young lady protesting against, um, against this building of a PX factory, chemical factory. And this image is circulated eventually before it was actually censored and blocked from being uh, shared on Weibo. So, Again, like you would find in Western media, Weibo is this powerful tool for not just you know, playful humor, but also for uh, more provocative uh, organizing like you would find in this image. So does the government recognize the power of Weibo? Yes, they do. Um, they realize that Weibo can not only be this force for you know, creating unrest and disturbances and perhaps like, disrupting what's taking place in the, with the status quo, but also can be this really fascinating uh, way to hold, have oversight over uh, local officials. Be able, uh, it's an opportunity to ha have really great feedback toward uh, internet users. And um, so there's this quote from uh, this party journal uh, in 2012, the Study Times, where they state, uh, Sina Weibo, it's like a double-edged sword. It only allows us to respond to crises and provide a tool that is more scientific and more expedient also has limitations and negative effects that are very prominent. So the government is aware that they need to control uh, Weibo if they want to uh, make sure that the things stay the same as they are now. So ways that the government goes about it, it's actually they've been ramping up on their side. And in response, internet users have been ramping up on their side too. So when the government and authorities implement all sorts of new technology to monitor and surveil citizens and to censor content, uh, internet users respond. So one of the ways that I like to talk about is how uh, government and authorities figured out a way to really quickly highlight and figure out, find posts that contain sensitive content by lurk searching for keywords. Uh, in response, internet users realized that governments and authorities were doing this, and they decided to embed their text within images, uh, a sort of uh, a steganography sort of technique. Um, however, the government then responded in kind by finding um, sensitive content, sensitive images, and, and doing sorts of image searches and wiping them out right away. So it's a cat and mouse game that goes back and forth, and it continues to this day. So uh, back to Weibo, some of the more uh, specific ways that the government actually does uh, filter content on Weibo. Uh, posting certain keywords, uh, either by themselves or in combination with other keywords. Uh, we'll give you this really uh, vague message that says, sorry, this content, um, and if you're interested, that's the keyword says Wen Jiabao, who's the former uh, prime minister in China. Uh, and the message that you get is, sorry, this content violates Sina's uh, rules, um, blah, blah, blah. If you need assistance, please contact customer service. Um, I, I wish you luck if you f feel like contacting them and seeing what they get back. So um, another way that they do it, uh, simply by deleting content. Content sometimes vanishes from uh, Weibo without a trace, um, except there have been uh, websites like Free Weibo, freeweibo.com, that actually suck up all the tweets that get posted on Weibo before they get deleted. And then when they do get deleted, they actually retain a copy of it and then share it with everyone. So this is an image that took place in Ningbo, uh, where, where this is an image of an of a, of a event that took place in Ningbo in uh, last week, or two weeks ago, actually. Um, we're not quite sure what's happening in the photo, but we do know that uh, apparently policemen are dragging away a man, and uh, the image was censored on Weibo. It actually, someone posted it, and then within a short amount of time, it was no longer on uh, Weibo. And actually, if you try and access it through the API, it'll give you a message that says, sorry, this content uh, doesn't exist, um, or permission denied. So um, that's a, another technique that Weibo is very uh, famed for using to get rid of content. Um, but my particular form of, uh, again, like I said, uh, the information control technique that I'm most interested in is these search blocks. Uh, search blocks are very flexible. You know, you can add words to the list one day, take them off the next day. Content's still there. However, what you're doing is inhibiting people from finding uh, information. 
So if some, there's some sort of protest going on, someone wants to look up information on it, if the, the sort of keywords that they're using to look for it uh, are on that blacklist, they'll get this message that says, uh, due to relevant laws, we can't show your results. And for this one, this keyword is uh, Wen Yun Song, who is actually the son of Wen Jiabao. And he's uh, notable in uh, China for being a billionaire. And you wonder, how did this guy become a billionaire? His father, perhaps? So uh, it's this sort of thing that uh, is, touches on sensitive uh, issues in China. A lot of times, th these words are blocked on Weibo, in addition to being filtered in other ways. So um, I'm not the only one doing this sort of research. A lot of other folks um, I was inspired by and have continued my line of work, uh, especially folks at China Digital Times, Gary King at Harvard, uh, folks at the University of Hong Kong who made a great tool called Weibo Scope, um, David Bamman, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and his associates at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, Jed Crandall and his associates at UNM, and uh, greatfire.org, which, uh, like I said, they run, uh, they do free Weibo, which is that tool that, you, that I showed before about tracking deleted posts, and also uh, this tool called uh, uh, greatfire.org, where you can actually see over time, historically, the sort of keywords and information that's blocked on Weibo. So this one is uh, showing you across time from March 2012 up to now uh, how Weibo treated searches for Bo Xilai, who is this corrupt politician, or allegedly corrupt politician, who was recently convicted and sentenced to uh, life in prison for his you know, various nefarious activities. And you'll see that based on current events, his name may or may not be blocked. So for instance, uh, you'll see in the beginning of April, there's a shift. Uh, that was when a lot of the scandals and rumors start to pop up. Uh, in late September, there's another shift. Uh, that's when he was actually kicked out of the party. And then all of a sudden, people were able to search for him. And people claim that that's perhaps due to the fact that the government wanted to continue to allow citizens to criticize him online. So as you could see, there's a correlation between uh, online events and offline events, which you know is, uh, seems fairly intuitive, but it's good to have the data there to actually show you. So uh, continuing on, so what did I do? Um, Great Fire, China Digital Times, they do fantastic work in confirming, uh, I think, what is sensitive and what isn't sensitive. So for instance, Bo Xilai is in the news about a corruption scandal. Let's check and see if he's blocked on Weibo to confirm whether or not Weibo thinks he's sensitive and worth uh, blocking. However, what about all the words that we don't know are sensitive? And uh, like, for instance, uh, foot fetish or other things like that. Uh, I think that's where I stepped in. What I did was I took uh, a giant list of words, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, Wikipedia's article titles, uh, for in the Chinese language edition, uh, which ran, totaled up to 700,000 keywords. And I ran them through Sina Weibo in this very simple script um, that tested or not whether or not each word was blocked or not. And then I uh, recorded them into a database and basically uh, did various things to try and understand why they were blocked, uh, including doing research into the history, the language, and other sorts of things. So, in the end, I came up with 500 uh, blocked keywords. And in the book, I have 150 of them that I write up in more detail, uh, reasons about why they are considered sensitive in Chinese culture and to the Chinese government. So without context, some of the words that I've organized thematically throughout the book. Um, so words related to government, CCP, politics, and nationalism. So a lot of them are fairly obvious, some of them less so, unless you know the context, which uh, hopefully I provide in the book, and which I'll do with some of the, these words in more detail later on in the presentation. So some other words about dissent, censorship, and justice. Sex, drugs, immorality. Uh, people. Uh, scandals, disasters, and rumors. Uh, as some of you know, uh, may know, uh, there's been a big anti-rumor campaign going on in China during the past uh, several months. So uh, rumors are clearly on the mind of the censors these days. Uh, information and media. Uh, security, violence, and other words that deal with people being suppressed. And then other words that I just don't have a clue why and uh, I think these are actually really remind us that there's a human element involved here. That uh, there, there are people actually putting these words on the list, and they know what's going on. Um, so, yeah. 
All right, so uh, we'll just go through a few of the words, and um, and hopefully this will be an uh, opportunity for you guys to uh, you know, give me some shout out if you know why they might be blocked. But uh, here's one. Uh, if you don't read Chinese, hopefully the uh, pronunciation might help you out. Any thoughts? There you go. Um, so tank, uh, tank is actually a reference to Tank Man. Uh, it was blocked for some time in early 2012. It's actually unblocked now. So now you can search for tanks to your heart's delight on Weibo. But uh, you're not going to see this image on Weibo or uh, through any sort of search uh, uh, engine on, in China uh, either. So because uh, obviously it refers back to this precarious time in Chinese history in 1989, uh, the day after the, the soldiers came in and cleared the square, uh, this man stood there on June 5th and blocked a column of tanks from entering and or leaving from Tiananmen Square. And uh, that's what we have. Uh, here's another one. Uh, literally, uh, it means hairy bacon. You pronounce it mao la ro. Mao means hair, and la ro is sort of like a, a preserved meat, like a jerky or bacon. Um, and uh, however, mao isn't only just a word for hair, it's also a, a surname, a uh, Chinese surname, if some of you may know uh, uh, a famous mao in Chinese history. And uh, so Mao Zedong. And, uh, Laro doesn't also just mean you know, preserved meat that you eat, but also uh, a different kind of preserved meat. Uh, Mao's body, which is laid in state uh, outside Tiananmen Square. So this is an example of a coded keyword uh, where uh, internet users have uh, decided that this is some sort of like coded insult for Mao, but also an insult for the current uh, government. So for instance, they'll say things to the effect of, oh, Mao Laro certainly wouldn't approve of today's policies uh, economic reform policies. So um, it's a way to get around uh, the censors by using words that uh, the censors wouldn't have known to block. However, you know, as, as I've shown, the censors figured this one out. They blocked it. And the only reason I was able to figure out that internet users were using this word was because uh, it was blocked. Uh, in fact, I've, you know, I asked when I was researching the book and I actually figured out this is a blocked word, I asked multiple native speakers and they had never heard of the phrase. And in fact, it's so obscure. You could only, I only find it in a couple of places, in fact, in a, in a recipe for how to prepare malaro. Um, you know, apparently, you dip it in you know, uh, nitrate, and you know, eventually, it's, it's able to keep in a glass case for up to 40 years. Um, so uh, I think this is an example of the sort of so-called Streisand effect. The fact that someone tried to prevent you from blocking it allowed, uh, gave greater prominence to it, uh, because otherwise, who would have known that malaro was uh, a, a sensitive term uh, when, in fact, so few people actually use this thing? So uh, again, internet users being playful and being caught up with. Uh, here's another one. This one is uh, actually not created by internet users, but by official media. Uh, if, in this case, official media in Hong Kong. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar, China has this sort of uh, uh, one country, two systems rule, where in Hong Kong, has this sort of more liberal policies with regards to freedom of information, uh, uh, freedom of expression. You know, their sort of political system is more free than it is in China. Uh, and in this case, uh, yeah, so empty stool refers to uh, the empty chair that uh, Liu Xiaobo uh, would have uh, sat in but was vacated uh, at the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. So empty stool was a reference in Hong Kong media talking about the empty stool. And um, so there you have it. So media is also closely watched, uh, not just internet users. Uh, here's one that internet users uh, are, were able to contribute to. Uh, this one is Yue Yue Now, which literally means month, month bird. But uh, as an example of the sort of games that internet users like to play, uh, this actually, if you put them together, equals a single character, Peng, uh, in reference to Li Peng, who was the former uh, premier of China. And he was actually the one in uh, June 4, 1989, or back in 1989, who actually pushed for uh, the government to enter into the square and be more assertive about dealing with the protesters. So he's clearly a controversial figure in Chinese uh, you know, current events and history. Uh, and so, References to his name are sensitive online. So uh, when internet users recognize that you couldn't perhaps use his name 
or using his name itself, the, 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 the one with the characters all squished together, using his name as sensitive and may cause your post to be deleted right away. They decided to split it up and as a sort of game to try and get around the censors. Unfortunately, this was also uh, caught, and uh, so Yue Yue Now, Month Month Bird, the monthly bird, is uh, now lo no longer uh, acceptable discourse on Weibo. Okay, uh, here's one that's more historical in nature. Wu uh, Wang, so it literally means never forget or don't forget. And in this case, this one is actually a reference to a four-character uh, idiomatic phrase in China. Uh, which means don't forget uh, that we're in Ju, uh, the city of Ju, which is, you know, relates back to a historical uh, moment in China wherein uh, this general and his troops were actually surrounded in this small city. And, um, the you know, these forces were all around them. And basically he said this phrase to them, don't forget that we're in the city of Ju. And then they fought back and they retook the country back. So any thoughts what parallels that might have to uh, Taiwan. So uh, basically, this, this uh, inscription is actually in uh, Jimin, and it's a reference, and it was put there by Chiang Kai-shek um, as a sort of uh, rallying cry to tell uh, Taiwanese citizens that we'll, we'll come take back the mainland. Uh, so clearly, that's sensitive, uh, Taiwanese-Chinese politics. Uh, but also, this phrase is also used uh, in a different way, uh, a different thing that we shouldn't forget. Uh, don't forget 6-4 or June 4th. So again, um, that phrase can be used for historical slash political references, but also more uh, recent uh, events. Uh, another more recent event, so keywords can oftentimes be related to very contemporary events. Uh, in this case, uh, the term blocked, oh, in this case, the term rich woman uh, refers to a specific rich woman Guomei uh, Mei from uh, in recent years, she actually uh, was a woman who posted on Weibo that she was an employee of the Red Cross in China. And uh, she then flaunted images of herself in front of a Maserati, in front of her Hermes handbags, first class plane tickets. And obviously, Chinese netizens were outraged that someone associated with uh, a, char a charity could be uh, so rich, and they wondered how she got her wealth. Eventually, you know, did this human flesh search. Uh, eventually, uh, essentially, you know, netizens banding together to you know figure out who a person is, and they figured out who she was. And uh, she had to come out and apologize. The Red Cross in China had to come out and say, uh, disassociate themselves from her, and say that she actually wasn't an employee. Um, and uh, in the end, actually, this event had severe repercussions on the Red Cross in China. And uh, their donations fell by something up to close to 50% the following year. So the power of internet users in China. Uh, two more, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So uh, this one, Gao Yao Qi. Uh, this one's just sort of fun. Gao Yao means um, like plastic, plaster medicine, where it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's like plastic. Um, uh, and Qi is flag. So that refers back to the sort of like medicinal patch that Chinese users like. Uh, to Chinese folks use for healing themselves. And, but it's also a coded uh, uh, insult for the Japanese flag and Japanese people because it sort of looks like the Japanese flag. So that's another fun one, playing with images. And then the last one we'll do, uh, satellite television uh, is actually, um, a, you know, again, a lot of these words are out there. I'm just putting out my best guess. But in, in this case, the reason why this might be blocked uh, maybe due to the fact that uh, back in, uh, I believe, in the 1990s, um, Rupert Murdoch tried to enter China by uh, creating this uh, satellite television company, Sky. And uh, he actually stated in an interview, uh, advances in technology communications have proved, pr proved an unambiguous threat to totalitarian regimes. And basically said that, we're, we're coming for you, China. Uh, we're going to bring in satellite TV. We're going to open up uh, your country. And uh, Chinese folks didn't take too kindly to this. Uh, folks, uh, the Chinese authorities actually banned satellite television. Uh, so satellite dishes are technically illegal in China. Uh, and then Rupert Murdoch actually had to spend the next uh, decade trying to uh, recover from that faux pas and uh, trying to suck up to the Chinese government. Um, and uh, if you wander around China today, even though satellite dishes are uh, technically illegal, um, you'll find that uh, folks have uh, decided to uh, flaunt or flout that ban. 
So um, I think that's, that's uh, the keywords that I'll just present today. If you're interested in more, of course, you could read my book or my blog, Blocked on Weibo. But I just wanted to close today by talking a little bit about uh, uh, what we can take away from this, um, seeing how Chinese, inter Chinese authorities uh, regulate the internet and control the information online, I think is fascinating, not just you know, in a purely China context, but also looking at how things are affecting uh, regions around the world, uh, not just authoritarian regimes in Iran, Syria, and elsewhere, but also here in the US, uh, in Europe. Uh, you have all sorts of uh, tension between private companies, between governments, between internet users, about how much information is allowed to be shared online, and which uh, and what sorts of information shouldn't be shared, and who gets to decide. I think that's uh, sort of the conversation that hopefully my book will be able to spur. Um, you know, where, does, where, where do we actually draw the line between uh, trying to protect the security of everyone versus trying to promote uh, and, and allow folks to have the individual expression um, that we so need in, in, in societies? So um, hopefully the book isn't, an isn't, isn't something that's purely out there to attack China, but instead it's an opportunity to understand the motives for why authorities might decide to censor certain content. And uh, by doing this, we can hopefully uh, figure out ways to uh, provide incentives and try and understand uh, how to nudge authorities to trying to dismantle some of these obviously very restrictive uh, environments that we have around the world today. So thank you so much for having me, and uh, be happy to take any questions that you all have. So uh, if you guys have any questions about uh, China, uh, particular keywords, about my research, or anything else. Yep. So um, what are the age range of the people who are uh, saying these kind of keywords? Are they younger? Because it seems like a lot of the, a lot of the keywords you mentioned have historical reference. So I'm wondering how much of that history is, is uh, uh, the younger people are cognizant. Yeah, um, I think that's that's a very important point. The very fact that you have to use uh, sometimes these coded keywords to get around the sensors uh, means that by the very nature that you're using these keywords, you're sort of losing out uh, on communicating in a more direct fashion with uh, uh, the mass folks. So you know, using yu now or using uh, that that uh, idiomatic phrase uh, means that the sensors are are being effective. They're essentially cutting off uh, a, a chance for you to connect with everyone. However, um, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the push for internet users to try and use phrases that are uh, coded in a way, but also very uh, understandable to everybody. So, uh, so for that idiomatic phrase, maybe not everyone knows it. But other things like um, May 35th, which is a coded keyword for June 4th, I think most folks in China do recognize what that means. Um, and so it's trying to find, you know, within that cat and mouse game, to try and find this, uh, to walk the line of being evasive, but not so evasive that you don't actually connect with the internet users. So in terms of actual age, uh, Weibo is primarily, like most social media, uh, a youth-driven uh, media. So uh, folks, college kids. Uh, but it's also really uh, been this uh, powerful tool for not just youth and their frivolous, you know, posting uh, pictures of what they did last night, um, you know, but also uh, for activists and uh, journalists. Um, so you'll find a lot of those folks online on Weibo as well. So, so this is interesting. I was actually in Toronto, and um, and someone came up and asked a question, or basically said. Oh, I, I posted on Weibo that I was attending your talk, and I posted an image of your book. And uh, within five minutes, the post disappeared. So I don't know if that's indicative of what's happening, but um, it's interesting. I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but the blog, uh, which the book is based on, isn't blocked in, uh, in China um, because you know uh, I think it's written in English, and it doesn't really have a big uh, user base in China. So it doesn't really matter to Chinese authorities so much. But uh, is that is interesting. Um, as for hashtags, I don't. I think hashtags aren't quite as uh, big a deal on, on social media in China uh, because um, one, perhaps because of the language, uh, not issue, but language, uh, you know, uh, opportunity. Uh, Chinese is such more 
uh, so, so much more compact than English in that each character actually represents uh, an entire word. So 140 characters, you actually say a good amount of uh, in 140 characters. So you don't really need hashtags as a way of like for, you know this sort of reductive meme sort of um, uh, tool. So you, you're actually able to say what you want. Uh, but in Chinese social media, I think images are super powerful. Um, those get circulated so widely. Um, even images of whole essays. So you, you'll often find people who post, um, you know, they'll, they'll actually type out, you know, a 300, 400, 500 character essay, sometimes even longer, take an image of, or, you know, make an image of it and post that. And that sort of thing gets circulated very widely. So, uh, question is you've got a very rich descriptive account uh, sort of focused on particular words and themes and you have stories associated with them. To what extent does this help you anticipate what future censorship and sort of dissident interaction is going to look like? Yeah, I think what's particularly interesting is how uh, uh, internet users are trying to shift away from this sort of public facing social media. So they've, as you know, a lot of uh, folks in authoritarian uh, societies have realized that uh, posting material publicly is great for uh, sharing information. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Um, so the question was about um, how does my research anticipate uh, what sort of uh, future uh, shifts and trends will take place in social media in China? So, um, so public-facing social media is a great opportunity to connect with folks, but it's also an opportunity, or you know a chance for uh, information controls to be placed on it. So I think a lot of folks are shifting away from uh, public facing social media like Weibo towards more semi-public or, or private social media like um, WeChat and other sorts of these uh, chat clients that a lot of folks are using now on uh, their mobile devices. So in this way, you could still have you know thousands of followers on, on WeChat, and you could blast out a post to them. But uh, there's no, hopefully, no overseer sneaking in uh, and, and, and surveilling your conversation and censoring you and potentially dragging you to jail. So I think that's a one potential shift. Yeah, so the question was, uh, based on my research, can, can I, do I have a sense of how much of the censorship is automated and how much of it is uh, human uh, input? Um, I, think it, I think looking at my, my list, I think it was fascinating, especially to me, what was most fascinating to me was the human element involved. Like, for instance, uh, you'll notice that the word hoobastank was blocked on, uh, on Weibo for some time. Um, and which was weird to me because, uh, from what I know, Hubastank isn't a very politically active uh, band or music, music act in China. But uh, in fact, what I think was happening there was the word English word tank, which is part of Hubastank, was the, the blocked keyword. But in fact, when I searched for the word tank at that same time, tank was unblocked, and Hubastank, or maybe the word stank itself, was blocked. So maybe. There was a typo somewhere. So these are the sorts of things that you that you uh, uncover. And uh, the other sorts of research that I've done at the Citizen Lab with collaborators up there, we've noticed also you know, various incidences of you know the human censors making mistakes. Sometimes they'll upload a like you know upload a, a list of black, blacklisted keywords, and they'll accidentally unencrypt or they'll accidentally encrypt it the wrong way, and it doesn't work. And you'll see them frantically uploading a new file like you know 30 minutes later. Um, so there's a human element involved, um, and I think even. More, um, you know, providing more insight is this recent Reuters story about uh, where they interview actual censors, human censors who work at these facilities. Uh, this one was in Tianjin, outside Beijing, and they said that there was something um, close to uh, several thousand censors who work in a facility. Um, they they work in shifts. They work in ten-hour shifts. The folks come in. They they you know, but they do have automated tools to help them uh, identify and flag. Uh, sensitive keywords. So there is uh, computer assistance involved. Uh, there are algorithms that they've written, and they're constantly getting better and helping their, uh, the human sensors do their job even more uh, thoroughly.
Yeah, like I said, the, the, with the question before about um, how do we, how do internet users walk that fine line between communicating to everyone and also still uh, evading the censors? And one of the ways they do it is with humor, with with funny images, with memes, with sort of these inside jokes. So, for instance, um, back in uh, uh, the June f recently uh, for the June Fourth uh, commemoration, which takes place every year in China, internet users actually posted an image of the Tank Man, but they replaced all the tanks with this giant rubber duck. So you had four giant rubber ducks, uh, you know, facing off against a guy. So that's that's you know absurd and silly. And for the government to crack down on that would you know would sort of be a statement about how they're maybe not just not in favor of uh, discussion of political sensitive content, but also not in favor of humor. Um, uh, so that's one method. Uh, but yeah, it's it's obviously. A similar, th sim it's it's a, it's a tactic that I think uh, internet users have recognized that you don't purposely conf you don't punch the government in the face. Perhaps they've learned that that's not a very effective tactic. We've seen from Liu Xiaobo and other folks who go out there directly promoting uh, political change. Uh, they tend to get dragged in, and uh, that perhaps isn't an effective tactic. So what they do is they organize things like. You know, everyone wears a black T-shirt on a particular day. They go out and walk the streets. They take a stroll. That's that's the sambu, which is the, the their method for, I guess, the sort of eating ice cream in the square. So, um, you know, I, I think both methods are important. You know, supremely important uh, in terms of you know fermenting change in China and progress. You need serious political activists, but you also need these sort of uh, lighthearted attempts to sort of. Show how ludicrous some of the censorship system is. QQ, they have groups. Um, is, is data available to your kind of analysis on, on something like that? The QQ groups and QQ instruments being kind of social stuff? Yeah, yeah. QQ is another. Uh, the question was about uh, can we also track censorship on QQ, uh, which is a chat client within China. Uh, that, a chat client that's used around the world, but it's created by a Chinese. Uh, chat company called Tencent. Um, so yeah, the, the, it's, it's actually interesting. Um, one of the first real major you know, censorship gold mines um, or for censorship researchers was, was actually, I think it was in the late 1990s, or I forget when it was, but uh, hackers actually figured out that um, uh, QQ was storing on your computer uh, a certain file that Basically, every time you typed information in your chat window, it would compare it with this file. And if anything was uh, contained in that file, they would actually uh, censor your content. So uh, hackers actually extracted the, the, the keyword list and actually um, uh, shared that widely. And I think uh, that was one of the first instances of uh, reverse engineering the sort of censorship that uh, is built into these sort of systems. So uh, yeah, there, there, there's definitely um, uh, researchers who are actively looking into various ways that chat clients like QQ and WeChat and other social media are being used, f uh, are actively censoring and surveilling users. What additional metrics do you have on the effectiveness? Because it seems like uh, for all their censorship, I mean, it may block some casual users, but between all the evasions and all the ways people rephrase things, you said that in the case of like the Red Cross incident, they blocked the keyword, but it still affected their donations by 50%. So it doesn't seem like the information is still getting out to the majority of people, or is it only the ones that really know who fuck around with? Yeah, it's, uh, the question was about uh, how much do we, uh, how effective do we actually think the sort of uh, blocking and censorship is? Uh, because based on what we've seen, um, internet users are able to evade the censors. So. Um, I think the, the answer is that, or I think you know, one way to look at it is that we only know about certain, certain like for instance, the, the Red Cross incident. We know about that incident. But what about the many dozens, or for, for each of those cases, many dozens of cases that we don't know about? So we, we may just have a little tip of the iceberg. We can see these sort of uh, ways where the internet users were able to evade the sensors and were able to uh, produce uh, profound change, but there are many. You know, the the whole point of censorship is that it's it's uh, it's obtuse. We'll, we'll we'll never find out. We'll never know uh, unless you know more research gets done. Someone releases information, that sort of thing. So, um, and based on 
other research that people have done, uh, there's a study by uh, uh, Ewan Robinson where they look into uh, why people actually want to evade, sen evade uh, sensors or want to, why would people want to escape restrictions in China? And for the most part, folks aren't interested in you know, engaging in political activism. <laughs> folks are really pretty much interested in just getting a stable internet connection, getting access to information. And um, so based on that sort of thing, you get the sense that Chinese internet users, the majority of them, are for the most part satisfied with um, the sort of um, material that they have online. You know, they, they don't have YouTube, but they have Yoku. They have, instead of Facebook, they have Yanyan. So this, this sort of thing, um, I think, appears to be uh, taking place in China. But you know, obviously, there are hardcore, dedicated folks who are focused on expanding freedom of expression in China, making sure that there's social justice and that sort of thing. And they do play a large role uh, in the social sphere. Yeah, uh, so the question, yeah, so the question was about um, this. This this is about content that's being blocked. But what about the people who post this sort of content? Do they fear for their lives? Are are there uh, sort of uh, ways for the government to track them? And the answer is yes. Um, social media um, uh, in China, uh, technically, for for some time, uh, the government's imposed a, uh, a rule where social media had to require that people provide their real names to register. So um, obviously. There are ways to loopholes to get around it. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the ways the real name registration required was uh, using your cell phone. So sometimes people would use just throwaway cell phones and stuff like that. But in theory, technically, you know, every cell phone that you that you sign up for, technically, the the vendor is supposed to have your uh, actual real information. But you know, it's it's that's China. Um, so. Or any country where where this sort of thing is just like, come on, you're really gonna, yeah. So, um, so there, there. This has been a major issue, especially within the last uh, over the past several months and over the summer, wherein Ch Weibo and other social media have been targeting the so-called big Vs, uh, these verified users on Weibo, who are these celebrities. They have millions of followers. They they are very powerful. They're the power users of of Weibo, and they're known publicly. They're intellectuals, scholars, uh, activists, uh, lawyers, but also just like actors and actresses and stuff like that. So, um, and we've seen that um, in actually in March, the, the head of the state information, state internet information office actually brought in all of these, a bunch of big Vs and actually had dinner with them. Uh, he called them in, sat them down and said, look, we need to make sure that social media in the future isn't filled with rumors, isn't filled with malicious lies. We have to make sure that what we're posting is um, you know, supportive of, of, uh, of a healthy society. So um, people got the message. And um, over the summer, actually, there was a big crackdown, and a lot of these big Vs were actually dragged in. There was one, um, there was, uh, one, uh, one economic writer, uh, Charles Schwe, who was actually brought in. He was, had to do this forced confession. Um, uh, there were other folks who have been arrested recently. So um, it's clear that the government is very interested in targeting individuals as well, in, in addition to censoring content. Yeah, um, obviously there are hardcore folks within China who are very adamant about using products that aren't censored. So when Google did pull out of China, you know, you had people laying wreaths and flowers at the Google office because they were they were really saddened by the fact that um, that a company like Google left China uh, and now they were forced to use products like Baidu, which you know, if you haven't used Baidu, it's actually a pretty good search tool so long as you're not searching for sensitive content. Um, so. I think that's um, that's that's sort of there, there are these there are folks who are very very much into using you know Twitter and YouTube from within China and the thing is for the most part if you want to use Twitter and Facebook within China you have the tools to allow you to get access to them it's not like Iran where 
Um, sometimes they throttle the internet to the point where you can't use YouTube. Um, you could actually use, v well, now VPNs are a little more dicey since it's harder to get a good solid VPN that works for a while. But you know, you can use various types of circumvention tools to get access to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter from within China and if, if you want to. The thing is, most folks, why go on Twitter when all your friends on Weibo? It's network effects. So um, it's, it's fairly entrenched at this point, Weibo and other sorts of social media. So um, I, think, I think for the most part, Chinese internet users, some of them may actually use domestic products out of patriotism. For the most part, I think folks are just, um, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, I don't know, la not necessarily lazy, but that's the tool, that's the thing that you know, loads up when they start their computer, that's what they use, so. Sure. Uh, so the question was, uh, again, going back to uh, whether the government is tracking or uh, tracking people uh, with regards especially to uh, sucking up metadata and uh, whether or not uh, we think companies like Sina or the government are uh, using this sort of metadata as a way to uh, figure out uh, who should be brought in for questioning. Uh, so I think um, I certainly don't have uh, knowledge of uh, metadata being used in this sort of fashion. Um, I think uh, from the sort of uh, anecdotal evidence that we have, it's more uh, straight surveillance. Um, if they f know that you're a activist, um, they may uh, get access to your WeChat account and then start tracking the messages you post. And then when you say, oh, I'm going to be having lunch at uh, Chaoyang Square or whatever, um, you, they send an officer who follows you and then you get there and you notice that the officer's there and you wonder how they got there. So that's the sort of thing that uh, I think is their method for tracking uh, 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 sensitive people. As, as, a, as for you know, figuring out the, from the vast big data like who might be terrorists or whatever, I'm sure that their equivalent of the NSA is doing the same sort of thing that the NSA is doing here. Um, but we're, I don't know if individual netizens who are just like looking at pornography online should be worried that uh, their metadata is going to be sucked up and then somehow they're going to end up in prison. I think the government, Chinese authorities, you know, they're, they're you know, efficient. They've, they know who they should be focused on and I think that's not their primary uh, target. Yep. Another question, just uh, you're referring to China's NSA and we haven't really talked much about who concentrated solely in the sort of propaganda ministry that has controls on this, or is there, are there multiple agencies or groups that are involved in censorship within China from what you can infer from your research? Yeah, so the question was about who's actually performing this sort of censorship, what government agencies and or uh, uh, folks are involved. And um, clearly, yeah, there, it's, it's something that's politically driven in some ways. Um, so you have the this new uh, bureau called the State, Informa State Internet Information Office, which uh, was sort of an offshoot of the State Council uh, Information Office, which is now supposedly the, the lead figure in, in for uh, performing this sort of information control. But you have all these other ministries and bureaucracies that are involved. And, um, but you also have not just uh, these multiple agencies and bureaucracies, but you also have to notice that there's a national level of, of information control, but then you also have local officials who are involved. You have police security bureaus and other folks who uh, have different interests than maybe the national uh, 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 agents. So you have these different layers. And then you throw into that, you have uh, private companies who are vested interest in preventing um, you know, any sort of potentially even sensitive discussion taking place on their site. So you have you know, another layer of censorship there, and then you have the actual users themselves who have to self-censor, uh, who actually 
uh, report on other users who are posting provocative content. So you have these multiple layers, and it's not uh, very clear. Uh, it's not as simple as as uh, they're doing it, or you know, it's them. Uh, it's it's very much a decentralized, diffused uh, censorship system, which is I think uh, a feature of the Chinese uh, uh, system. All right, I think. Everyone is too scared, and we're going to call it quits. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, everyone, for it.